Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the on-record portion of the Rockridge Report. I'm Holly Southers, and joining me today is senior special writer for the Wall Street Journal, Mitra Kalita. Thanks for joining us, Mitra. Thanks for having me. You have had such a fascinating career throughout your lifetime, from covering a major newspaper in India to covering the worst economic recession in the United States since the Great Depression. What do you view as your most successful achievement, and which one are you most proud of? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> well, it depends on which lens you look at it through, but I would have to say that launching Mint, the business paper in India, um, is second only to birthing a child as far as um, an achievement that I'd be proud of. And that's largely because I went um, into a country that I thought I knew and had to relearn. Mm -hmm. um, but also, anytime you're involved in a startup, any entrepreneur across the country can attest to how much of your heart and soul you have to put into that. And it becomes very pure as far as the mission, um, which I've worked at very large news organizations. I work at the Wall Street Journal now, one of the world's largest newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, and to go to a no-name startup where you really get to do everything forces one to examine why journalism? What is the role of media in a democracy? Um, what lessons can we learn from the demise of newspapers elsewhere in the world and apply to this one in order for it to be successful? Critics say that you have a way of personalizing a story and bringing each story that you report on to life. When you begin, when you have a story idea, how do you begin reporting on it and how do you bring each one to life? Um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, the, um, working at the Wall Street Journal has really helped in many ways because um, even though we're now a general interest newspaper, our roots as a business um, newspaper and having a business audience in some ways force you to rely on policy and data to guide your stories. And so while I do pride myself on humanizing a story, as a reporter, the first place I often look is what does the data tell us? And mm -hmm. now data can certainly be misleading, and there's certainly many statisticians on campus that can poke holes in a lot of the economic data that we've um, seen coming out of the most recent recession and recovery. But it does help guide reporting to say, you know, wh who are the faces of the unemployed? Um, and to sort of start your reporting with questions like that. And chances are, if the data indicates that there is a certain trend or something going on, it shouldn't be hard to humanize that story because um, it's much better to start out that way than the other way, which is a lot of reporters will kind of come up with an idea and think it's a trend mm -hmm. and then sort of try to fill it in and it's almost like they're creating news and mm -hmm. I, I try to stay away from that. And how many sources will you often look at when you are reporting on a story, especially one that has to uh, pertains to the economy and when you're handling economic data? Well, the, the, the sad part is that we interview many, many people. They just don't make it into the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So it is very common that I'll interview you know, a dozen or more people for one article, but I just have to pick three or four people. And that's not to say that those that didn't make it weren't helpful. If anything, those are the people that allow us to write with authority. So um, I try to talk to more than I end up using. That's my general rule. And a lot of it depends on how involved the story is. On some stories, I spend weeks. and other stories, I spend a matter of three or four hours. Um, and of course, the ones that you have less time with, you don't have, you don't have the luxury of casting as wide of a net. And with the recent turmoil in the Middle East, I know that you frequently report on the global economy. How do you think this turmoil will affect the economy on a global scale currently? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we actually need to look at the economic roots of the unrest that we're seeing. Um, and it's often been framed as a political um, upheaval, right? These are, uh, these are populations dissatisfied with their leaders, um, and therefore they're revolting. But you know, a, a good part of reporting is often to rewind the tape a little bit and maybe look at some data. So if you look at, for example, Egypt, you'll actually find that a large number of youth um, have been educated. They've received their bachelor's degrees, but they're having a very hard time finding jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, the 
global unrest that has sort of been created, um, you could form parallels in other economies right now. And while people largely want to talk about the economic impact in terms of oil prices, and certainly that is um, wreaking havoc in the market, um, if we look at sort of more macro effects as well as what the lingering um, lessons of this might be, um, it's you know countries that have really invested in education over the last few decades are to be lauded, but it's clear that with a bachelor's degree comes an expectation that a job should follow. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that probably wouldn't sound all that um, foreign to a U.S. graduate right now, mm -hmm. you know, because as you know, you're yes, graduating of into one of the worst economies in a generation. Um, so I think that's one lesson that we can um, pull from the unrest in Egypt. And also it really does illustrate um, the linkages of a global economy, right? That you're all graduating into a truly global workplace. And several of the protest and the turmoil has been accredited to um, the new use of social media in several of these nations in the Middle East. Do you think that that will continue to have a lingering effect in other nations as more upheavals occur, more overthrows occur for these governments? You know, it was interesting to see the attempt to black out um, the social media. So you don't like the message, so let's kill the messenger. Well, because of these same linkages, the global economy does not have borders, right? So. Hosni Babarak might say, I don't want people Twittering, but that didn't stop. In fact, for example, I have a friend from Egypt who on her Facebook status would update it through her sister who lives in Philadelphia, and she would call her and that sister would update my friend's Facebook status. And so the message still gets out. Um, and I think this most recent um, incident actually proved the power of social media and really effecting change. Um, it's something that I'm sure will be studied closely as far as you know the study of revolution and um, um, of such democracy movements. Um, but it was a it was a, a good case of in some ways how social media actually creates um, its own democracy, if you will, right? Because there is no way that. Um, that speech could have been suppressed. I mean, it was suppressed, but the message still very much got out there. Mm -hmm. And you helped launch Mint, which is a business new newspaper in New Delhi, India. What were the challenges that you faced by helping launch a major newspaper in another nation? My first challenge was that I'm an Indian American. I was born in Brooklyn. My parents are from India. Um, so when I went back to, I mean, people would say, you're going back to India. And I would say, no, I'm actually not going back anywhere because I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, so some of it was an identity issue as far as having to constantly explain myself why I was there, why would you leave the U.S., which for decades has been kind of the, you know, the land of making it for a lot of Indians, right? It's a proof that you've made it if you get here and are successful. Um, so some of it was just that explanation. Um, but then the other challenge was proving my, almost proving my credentials as a journalist, that there was a bit of having to start all over again um, because I'm working with people who don't know me. They, can't, they don't know editors who've worked with me. They don't kind of have the same networks that exist in the United States to vouch um, for me as a journalist. So I had to rebuild that. Um, and then the other part that was more of a personal challenge is that my family is from very rural India. Um, my father was the first to go to college and his, um, his brothers and sisters have pretty much all remained in the region that he's from. And so when we report on this Indian economic success story, the Indian economic miracle, if you will, it's very difficult when your background um, knows that the reality is that that has not spread to everybody. So another challenge was to make sure that that viewpoint was reflected um, on the pages of our newspaper, even a business newspaper that you might think is tasked largely with covering a country's elite. Mm -hmm. And you also wrote a book about your journey while you were over there called My Two Indias. What made you want to write about your experience? You know, I resisted writing about it per, writing about India personally. Mm -hmm. I um, first thought I would write a book about the Indian economy. And that same identity question that I kind of arrived with of 
you know, not to sound overly cliche, but am I an American, am I an Indian, which is what everybody was asking me anyway, became a really unique lens to view this country through because while I am a Westerner and in some ways was brought over to India for the Western work ethic and ideals and journalism that I could impart, um, I also am the daughter of a first-time college attendee. Um, I am the granddaughter of a village that still very much identifies with me and my family. And it was clear that there was a dueling narrative going on as I was um, experiencing India, as I was writing about India. And I happened to write a column um, for Mint when I was there, and I found that my questions about how do you grapple, um, how do these two Indias meet each other, how do these two Indias reconcile um, with each other, was really the burning question of the country and its economy at that moment. So that's how the book essentially came about, was that I viewed my own journey as an effective way to tell that story. And have you received feedback? Have other people been able to relate to that, especially, you know, obviously in India, but um, as well as in the United States as being such a melting pot of a culture. Have you, have people reached out to you that they've been able to understand and have had shared the same experience? I have actually gotten a number of emails from people, a lot of children of immigrants, whether they're from India or Ireland or China or Latin America, um, I think we all kind of grow up with this question of what would have happened if my parents never left. Mm -hmm. And so I have gotten some feedback from people that says, you know, you almost answered not just the question of what would have happened of why they left, but or of what would have happened if they had never left, but why did they leave, right? It kind of allowed me to experience that firsthand. Um, I've also gotten feedback from a lot of women who are working in India and really sympathize with trying to juggle you know, work, family, a traditional culture, a culture that places very, very high expectations on the role of a woman um, who's both working and running the household. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something I didn't expect to write about so much, but um, it was clear that if there's superwoman, she exists in <laughs> India. Um, and I, I was, you know, a lot of that seems to have resonated with readers. Well, thanks for joining us, Mitra. And thanks for tuning in to the on-record edition of the Rock Bench Report. I'm Holly Southers. Have a great afternoon.